Okay, good morning. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. This morning we'll look at verses 8 and 9. Philippians chapter 4. And uh, just before I begin, I just want to say Merry Christmas again. Happy New Year. Uh, welcome everybody who's online. Good to see you. <laughs> Our first Sunday of the year, so being the first Sunday of the month, we will take communion, perfect way to start the year to remember the Lord, all of his grace and his goodness toward fallen man. Um, New Year season is um, always a time of traditionally of where you kind of stand at a threshold at the New Year, New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, you look back and you look forward, right? And oftentimes resolutions are made. As you look back, you consider and contemplate and think about things that you'd like to see improvements in your life, to live a healthier life as a whole person. Uh, and so, obviously, resolutions are made for better, healthier living. Usually includes something to stop doing and something to start doing. Um, all that to say that um, these verses that have providentially come before us this morning as we exposit through Philippians, are actually a perfect uh, sermon for the first sermon of the new year, in that Paul encourages and exhorts and commands, really, the church to do something for better, healthier living. Uh, very unique and fascinating words that Paul writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. This is not just a self-help, a little tip for advice or advice on how to live a better Christian life. This is, comes from heaven above, and it comes through God's servant, Paul, who I believed lived this out himself. Paul saw the worst in all of humanity. Uh, think about Romans chapter 1, and you know his opening words there as he writes about the condition of fallen man. And as he closes out that chapter, he just goes through a long list of terrible character traits that Paul himself recognized were within him, but he'd also been the recipient of all kinds of malice and unjust treatment for just loving Jesus and pronouncing the gospel and loving people and telling them the truth. And yet there was just venom that was spit back at Paul that he experienced personally all kinds of persecution and torture, really, for his faith. So he saw the worst. And I got to believe that these words that he writes for us today are words that he himself put into practice. And it changed him and caused him to live above the, the world that was around him. So... Uh, it's a spiritual discipline. We're talking today about the mind. Uh, the Bible, you know, I think one of the things that the Bible does tell us that is probably the most challenging for us and a, and a good resolution to have on New Year's is to love God, right? Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before might be the, the principle that Paul lived by as he pressed on towards the prize of the upward call of God. So forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before us. So Paul encourages a spiritual discipline, which is training the mind. Um, I should have maybe made, made a copy of, you know, much has been written about the human brain uh, the one organ in the body and, and how it functions and the billions of receptors and how they interact and, and the impulses that take place on any given second of a day that is far exceeds that of the amount of computation that can be done even in the most sophisticated computer system. In fact, people have said you could estimate the amount of uh, electronic switches that are necessary to run the electrical grid in New York City, multiply that times 10, and that's what's going on inside of between your ears. 
So uh, it's just a phenomenal thing. And Paul addresses that uh, discipline of training your mind to think well, uh, that truth of the input does produce an output. Uh, we know that in so many ways, and Paul really exhorts that today from these verses. So let's read them, and uh, I'll think together with you on those, intend, pun intended. Um, I guess, by the way, let me just say before I continue, uh, as I said that word, think together, uh, that is, um, we had that uh, format that we used, uh, our, what we call the town hall, uh, where we just came together under the topic of sort of a social issue of the day and thought together, biblically, how to address uh, race in the church and social justice. And that was a great uh, gathering that we had, I think, what was it, September or October? And then again, uh, in October, we had one on uh, politics, the church and politics. So I'm just throwing that out to you, whether you're here today, you're watching online. We want to just, we, the leadership, Andrew, Andy, myself, want to do continue on with this, right? There's just, uh, there was much fruit that was born out of that. So we would just put it before you and say, if you have any thoughts, uh, anything that's on your mind that you would like to have addressed for a town hall think together series, then uh, just text or email any one of us and we'll put that on the agenda and pray over it. And hopefully February, uh, sometime in February, we can unroll another Think Together gathering. So here we are, Paul in Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So these are Paul's final two commands. It's his last two imperatives that he writes to the church in Philippi, he has written many commands throughout this letter, and he really starts stacking up a good number of them in his final words. And uh, so these final two words, meditate and do. And that brings together that concept that I would mentioned just a minute ago, that the input produces output. And I believe that those two verses, these two verses, come together for that express purpose. Okay, so... Paul, if you put ourselves, first of all, in the shoes of the church in Philippi, uh, we've learned, what have we learned? <laughs> we've learned that Paul's theme in this letter is living the Christian life, that Paul had received a guest, one of the congregants in the church in Philippi, a man by the name of Epaphroditus, who showed up to Paul's prison cell in Rome and delivered to Paul a love offering that they had sent to him, just a, a thoughtful gift saying, brother, we're praying for you, we love you, here's some material goods that will maybe ease your life a little bit, and it's just something thoughtful that comes from their consideration of Paul, maybe a new cloak or maybe a new book. Right? Those were things that were dear to Paul. And his final letter that he ever wrote to anybody was to Timothy in 2 Timothy. And I think he said to Timothy, bring the cloak and bring my parchments. Right? Paul was a well-read man. Paul trained his mind. He was very disciplined in his mind. So again, the subject of ours this morning for our, that comes out of the text is living a healthy Christian life. And it's specifically a, a discipline of the mind, a spiritual discipline of training our mind. That's what I want to think about with you together, okay? So again, I put myself in the shoes of this church in Philippi. Paul's been very personal. He's been very personal with them. Remember what he said in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I mean, he could have just stopped there and said, stand fast in the Lord. But he added that word again, beloved. 
You are so dear to me. You're constantly in my thoughts. I pray for you. I think of you. I can see your faces in my mind in the times that we had together in fellowship. And though we're far apart, I am with you in heart and in spirit. So they, they, there's just this mutual love and companionship that the church had with Paul, their, their church planter and church father and brother and discipler. And so really, when you stop and you put yourselves in the shoes of these Philippians, we come to verse 8 of chapter 4, and Paul says, finally. And I'm being a little bit dramatic on purpose, because I think it was dramatic. What we've learned from this chapter, from this book, is that Paul is uncertain if he's going to live much longer. As this letter was put in the hands of Epaphroditus and sent back, and he was sent back to the church, and then it was handed to the leadership, maybe Epaphroditus himself, and it's read to the church. What they've learned from Paul is that whether I live or die, I am the Lord's. And, and, and I have no control over that. I desire to come to be with you, and I expect that by God's grace there will be a release, and I will see you shortly. But honestly, honestly, I can't be sure of that because there is a death sentence hanging over my head. And so for these people that had such a strong relationship, for Paul to say, finally, These are the last words that you may ever hear from me that come from me personally. And I think they sat on the edge of their seat. It may not necessarily mean that these words are the most important thing that I have to say. It just means that this is my last words to you. Of all the things that Paul could say, he was inspired to say these words. Meditate on things that are true and noble and pure and just or what is right. Whatever things are lovely and of good report. I'm reading it again. And then in the middle of verse 8, he said, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, some people see that as maybe just as a summation of the six qualities that he has just mentioned. Others see it as additional things to consider, things that are virtuous, things that are praiseworthy. I see it as a summation See, where Paul just, he lists these six qualities, and he, says, and, he, and he says, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, parens, in them, meditate. King James, think. Dwell upon. In the Greek, the word is logizomai. <laughs> logizomai. I don't often lay out Greek before you, but sometimes I do because it's interesting. We get our word logarithm from logizomai. Now, I'm not a mathematician, and I don't understand really what logarithms are, but it has something to do with computation, taking numbers and finding meaning in numbers. And, and the very thought, the very definition of that, logizomai or logarithm, it, it implies a, a consistent, determined thought. Time is devoted to one thing to, to get an outcome from that thing. My mathematician friends are smiling right now. I think I've just blown the definition of logarithm, but that's okay. You get the idea, right? It's, it's translated meditate, right? Meditate on these things. The book of Philippians actually has much to say about the mind, about the thought life, about what we give attention to, what we think about. 
I, I, I remember our introduction to the book some months ago, and, and we laid that out before ourselves and said, you know, some people make the point that the book of Philippians has more to say about the thought life, and it's an instruction about our brains, about our mind, and what we and how that influences our actions. That that could be the theme of the letter. So to think means to calculate, to compute, to count, to reckon, to weigh. It implies lengthy time spent on calculating or counting. You know, my foolish example that came to my mind, which has no credibility whatsoever, is counting sheep to fall asleep. <laughs> I don't know where that idea came from, but somehow it got into our culture and world through literature probably, but it's that same idea. Now here, now hear me out though. All right, if you think about the person who's having trouble going to sleep, and so the counsel is, well, just in your mind's eye, just imagine sheep coming into the pen and you're there to count them. And so you're sort of routinely and rotely going through this thing where you put your putty, you're paying it, here comes one sheep. Here comes two sheep, and it's sheep after sheep after sheep. Uh, and, uh, right, so you go to sleep, right? Think about this. This actually, this idea of logizomai, of, of, of determined thought on something is closer to you than you might realize. Because in context, in the context of Philippians 4, Paul sort of surprises us by mentioning two ladies that were at odds with each other. And I think that in context, this may be speaking to them. Certainly it is to them particularly, but broadly to the whole church, even to this day. And so using, what's at verse 2? Yodia and Suntuke to be of the same mind in the Lord. These two ladies that had some difference had occurred and there was a division among them and it was well known among the church, so much so that Paul could call them out publicly is through the reading of this letter. And I thought, well, that is interesting because to that I can certainly relate. Counting sheep, not so much. I generally don't have a hard time going to sleep. But to this idea of, ah, when I have a difference with somebody, the words and the thoughts that go around and around and around and around towards others that I disagree with, as I repeat in my mind the things that they have said or not said, the things that they have done or not done that have caused some friction in our relationship, things maybe that they've misunderstood about me, and you guys know what I'm talking about. This is so common to our human existence. These things happen, and we, and, the, and we repeat them. What are we doing? Logizomai. We're meditating on those things. We're giving careful consideration to something over and over and over and again, and, and we deceive ourselves because we, in that process, we, we might discover what we think is some new revelation about that person as a result of that repeated thinking over and again. That which we dwell upon, recalling and recounting the bad, the lies, the unjust behavior. What does it produce? Because that's Paul's, that's Paul's message here. His final words, the, the Spirit of God inspired him to write to the church, has to do with your thought life, your spiritual discipline of controlling your thoughts, and it results in good works. The output comes from the input. So in that context of the illustration that I'm using before you right now, in that context of when I get in the, the bad habit of giving a lots of time and thought life to things in, in a personal relationship where I disregard somebody, what comes out of that? Well, 
you can fill in the blank. But I'll speak to it from personal experience. Murder. I will murder that person in my life. I will just devalue them. It's possible. Hatred, division. Anything but the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm just using that as an illustration to say that what we think about will yield actions. What we think about will produce good actions. Even if the action is to do nothing instead of doing good, it speaks very loudly. It's still in that idea of the two ladies and so on. So finally, brethren, finally. <laughs> I get, I, I'm, just, I'm struck by that word finally, to be honest with you, and just understand this peace and there's no confusion. And so he put together two facts of peace and order. With God, there is no disorder, right? He's a God of peace and order. He will bring order and all things right into our lives as we think about these things. And by the way, you know, Paul, there's no confusion here. It's not contingent. Well, if I don't do these things, then God won't be with me? No, no, no. <laughs> right? Jesus promised, I'm with you even till the end of the age. Then what's Paul mean? I think he means that there will be a manifestation of God's presence with you in the midst of the hardships that they were going through or that we go through. Life is hard. The life was hard for the church in Philippi. Life is hard for the church in America today. Life is hard for the church. Life is hard in general. And there's, there's this beautiful thing that the church, who has the God of peace, who brings his character and his conduct into our lives, and it's manifested as we think well about him and we think about these qualities, Paul is, is saying that the input is going to produce an output. You're going to find yourselves doing the things that I did, my brothers and sisters. Paul, again, using himself as an example, as he so often does here in verse 9, the things which you learned and received and the things which you heard and saw. So they were, there was a discipleship where Paul opened the scriptures and he taught them, they brought them to faith and he discipled them in the word. But then he's like, come alongside, let's go to work together. I got to make some tents. I got to engage with some people here in Philippi. The things that you heard and saw. There's no question in our lives, in our minds, what Paul's life was like on the mission field. Basically, in a nutshell, he gave. Basically, in a nutshell, Paul gave. He gave his time, energy, and money, literally, to support other people, to support and to help people come to faith. Paul was a giver, and he told the church in Ephesus, the elders there, it's more blessed to give than to receive. In fact, well, that's what I'll say. <laughs> he was a giver. So isn't that interesting? If you're tracking with this rambling thoughts that I have this morning, right? The input, what we give our minds to think about for prolonged periods of time. Now, listen up, brothers and sisters, because I'm going to ask you some questions in closing. They're going to be very pointed and applicational. But what we give our minds Prolonged thought, and how long's prolonged? I don't know. <laughs> but logizomai, right? If I'm going to solve a mathematical equation that's really complicated, it's going to take some, some strenuous effort on my part. And Paul is saying to this church that what you think about for an extended period of time, it's going to produce out of you something that is good. You'll be a more giving person. You people, my brothers and sisters who use the Bible reading plan, the one-year Bible reading plan, what is this, the third? So you've already done Psalm 1, probably a companion psalm to Paul's words here, where the psalmist wrote, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. 
which literally means you talk to yourself. You, it's, a, it's a murmuring, I think is a Hebrew word. It's, to pronounce it, it sounds like you're murmuring. You're meditating day and night on God's word. But notice what he says. There's input. I'm, I'm training, I'm disciplining my mind to stop doing one thing and start doing another. I'm not going to walk in the way of the world, but I'm going to think about God's word. I'm going to think about it with my brain. A spiritual discipline, and notice there's an output, there's an outcome, there's a benefit. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You will have a fruitful life, one that other people can benefit from getting to know you and from observing your life. And that's back to Philippians. That's Paul's words. You're like lights in a crooked and perverse generation. And so he's saying to them, think well, think good thoughts. Okay, again, Paul's not some Pollyanna. He understands that this is a heathen city governed by paganistic, proud, arrogant Caesar who calls himself a divine person, human. It's just blasphemous. And then there, then that's the rule of the day. And Paul's like, embedded within that culture is this beautiful little body of people who love Jesus Christ and have discovered his love for them. But as a result of their faith, they were experiencing a lot of hardship, loss of income, loss of friendships. They, they'd been pegged and marked as people who were rebellious to the Roman Empire, a threat to society, which was absolutely a lie. It was untrue. But such is the nature of spiritual warfare. And so in the midst of all that, it's so easy for somebody who's fired you or, or is, is not giving you the, the rights and the respect that you deserve as a human being just because you identify as a Christian, it's so easy to let those things just permeate and pervade and prevail in our minds. So Paul gives them these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. I have just a few observations about these six things, or eight, however you want to count them. Just a few observations. First of all, the list is very unique. All of these qualities that Paul mentions, just to show you how unique this is, these were actually highly regarded qualities in the Greco-Roman world in which this church lived. Isn't that interesting? Paul doesn't talk about different fruit of the Spirit. He goes, I want you to meditate on Galatians 5.22. I already wrote that, brothers, sisters, in the ad. He takes something that, that humanity was in search of, things that are true, things that are pure and lovely and noble, of a commendable, of good report, and Paul's, he lists them, and he, and he discovers that in this Greco, in this human existence, there are things that people are in search of. Paul says, find those. Isn't that interesting? He uses, he chose to use the word whatever. I mean, he could have just said it once and then quickly given us, you know, these six qualities. But he kept saying Whatever which I think is very instructive. He's sort of broadening our view, and he's saying, you know, you can find beauty in a lot of different places and in a lot of different parts of this world, even in a fallen world. You will find beauty. Search for it. Have that be your mindset. And when you find something, one or all of these things, dwell on that for a period of time. Use that as a spiritual discipline in your life. And you too will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It'll bring shade and fruitfulness to other people's lives. So the observations that I observe, first of all, is that list is very unique. Paul takes these six qualities and he sanctifies them. And he puts them before the church. And he says, whatever, it opens the door to look everywhere in life. 
Another observation, very simple, very simple. They're outside of you. These qualities are outside of you. They're not inside of you. At least in the sense, brother and sister Christian, that we know that the flesh profits nothing. In the flesh, there is no good thing. It is corrupt. It is outside of me. In the sense that they're observed, these qualities are observed through two means, the eyes and the ears. I remember our study through Nehemiah in our men's group. Went through Nehemiah and the building of the wall and how the different gates, I think it was 12 gates that were built into the exterior wall of the ancient city of Jerusalem. And there was just a beautiful illustration of what goes in and out of that gate affects what's living inside of the walls. And those eye gate and the ear gate, if you will, what you bring into your mind will affect how you live. I think the Spirit's making that point clear today on this New Year Sunday. And God, the, the Spirit, is saying to us, I want some spiritual discipline in the, what you think about. And so these things are observed outside of us. They're observed, observed through the eyes and the ears. What is outside comes inside so that what's inside will come back out in the form of worship of God and benefit to other people or witness of God. I think these words and other observation are very helpful for those who struggle with depression, anxiety, inferiority complex, worthlessness, insecurity, many things that ail the human mind and the human spirit. I think they're very, very instructive. Because anybody can do this. By the way, it's not, it's not, Paul doesn't put an age limit on this. If you can think, you can do this. As a matter of fact, it's good for young and old to do this. It's very helpful for those who struggle in those areas of, that, that are complicated. Reason why it's helpful? Because those elements may dominate because we're looking within ourselves. That's the trap that often happens with a depressive attitude or an inferiority complex, right? Is that I, I, I'm thinking mostly about me. But remember, these qualities are outside of us. Paul's saying, stop looking within, look without, and meditate on those things. Another observation, <laughs> and I'll just give it to you the way that came to me, that this is not problem solving. And then I thought, but maybe it is. <laughs> Because for these two ladies, for example, Yodius and Sintuke, that had a difference among themselves, maybe this is problem solving. Because if they started to observe each other differently and to find some quality in their sister, it will change the way they think about them. It'll change, it'll bring unity where there once was division. So maybe there is some aspect of problem solving with this. And finally, my last thought, observation, comes from personal experience, and you can relate. It's hard work. My goodness, I can't even remember the six qualities. I put my Bible down, I go out for a walk, and I'm like, okay, I think I've memorized them, and I get it all mixed up, and I don't keep them straight. <laughs> But then that's just trying to memorize and meditate on the words that Paul has written. It's hard work to discipline your mind, to stay focused for a prolonged period of time on just one subject. Like any exercise, right? New Year's resolutions, I'm going to eat less and exercise more. Go for it. And as soon as you start exercising, you're like, oh my God, it hurts. I actually walked. I'm in pain. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult starting out because we're so out of condition. Stay with it. Train your mind to stay on something long enough to benefit from it. 
So in closing, I just have a few questions. How can you or me, I'll just say, how can we be obedient to this command from God? How can we do this? I want you to ask yourself, is this just something that's interesting? And it's like, oh, Paul's talking about the human mind. And he's saying, I really want you to meditate on these qualities. They're really good qualities. It's actually very, very, very important. The mind controls the brain. The mind actually is what controls everything you do. Very, 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 very seldom do we just spontaneously react to something or feel a certain way. Most everything that we do follows what we think. And so Paul's saying, and how they're timeless words, written to a church that's inundated. We're living in an information age. I guess it's still appropriate to call it that. It's on hyperspeed. So much comes at us. What do you say, 75, 80% of all American adults have a smart device in their pocket, a smartphone. We have instant connection to information, and it's constantly streaming, pun intended, before our eyes and into our mind. Input, what's it producing? Anxiety, feelings of loneliness, FOMO, you familiar with that acronym? It was new to me. <laughs> It's an acronym used in the social media world, right? Fear of missing out. FOMO, fear of missing out. If I don't connect, if I don't get that whatever, I'm going to miss out on something. That's just like streaming constantly. What's it producing? It's depressing to talk about what it produces. These are timeless words, my brothers and sisters. How can we be obedient to this? Are there other things that dominate my vision, hearing, and thus my attention and thought? Do I have margin in my life to devote to this mental exercise? Well, let me say this. I'm going to read you a few statistical stuff and an interesting story. It starts with something to stop doing, to give myself to prolonged thought on any one of these qualities, or all of them, there has to be a discipline of refusal. A discipline of refusal. Meaning, I am not going to keep bringing into my system and dominating my thought meaningless tweets or pictures. Former Secretary General of the UN, United Nations, Charles Malik, addressing a crowd of people at Wheaton College at the dedication of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Building. Timeless words. He said, believe me, my friends, the mind is in profound trouble, perhaps more than ever before. How to order the mind on sound Christian principles is one of the greatest themes that can be considered. Kent Hughes says this, we must lay down as fundamental, we must lay down as fundamental. Did you get that? Fundamental? <laughs> to our Christianity, this truth. We must lay down as fundamental to Christianity, this truth. Quote, a Christian mind is impossible without the discipline of refusal. A Christian mind is impossible without the discipline of refusal. And then he went on to tell a story by a, a, by a guy named Chuck Colson, who was sitting at dinner with a president of one of the three major television networks. Colson felt he had a tremendous opportunity to influence the man. This man was a president in one of the major television networks, NBC, ABC, CBS. The guy's a president. Colson's eating dinner with him sitting next to him at this dinner table, recognizes, here I am, a born-again Christian. He knows me. I'm a Christian thinker, well-known for my scandal in D.C., so on and so forth. He said he felt a tremendous opportunity to influence the man, so he told how millions of Christians were offended by the network's programming. Knowing that TV executives have an intense interest in profit, Colson suggested it would be good business to air wholesome family entertainment. After all, said Colson. 
There are 50 million born-again Christians out there. He looked at me quizzically. I assured him that was the latest figure from a Gallup poll. So what you are suggesting, Mr. Colson, is that we run more programs like, say, Chariots of Fire. Yes, I exclaimed. That's a great movie with a marvelous Christian message. Well, he said, CBS ran that movie as a primetime movie just a few months ago. Are you aware of the ratings? Suddenly I knew I was in trouble. He then explained. That night, NBC showed On Golden Pond. It was number one, with 25.2% of all TV sets in America tuned in. Close behind was My Mother's Secret Life, a show about a mother hiding her past as a prostitute. It was number two, with 25.1%. As a distant third, a big money loser, was CBS with Chariots of Fire at 11.8% viewership. In fact, of the 65 shows rated that week, Chariots of Fire was number 57. So, my companion concluded, where are your 50 million born-again Christians? Ouch! The discipline of refusal. Hughes goes on to say, I am aware of the wise warnings against using words like all, every, and always in what I say, but I'm going to do it anyway, and here it is. It is impossible for any Christian who spends the bulk of his evenings, month after month, week after week, day in and day out, watching the major TV networks or cut contemporary videos to have in Christian mind. This is always true of all Christians in every situation. I have intentionally quoted this because it's dated. In fact, I'm gonna to quote to you some work from a guy named Neil Postman, who was a professor of media, expert professor dude out of New York University, who says that between the ages of 16 and 18, the average child, or six and 18, the average child spends some 15 to 16,000 hours in front of the TV, whereas only 13 hours in school. I know, kids are going, praise the Lord. Postman says that during the first 20 years of an American child's life, he will see some 1 million commercials at the rate of 1,000 per week. As to television's effects, the results are infamous. Shortened attention span, lessening of linguistic powers, reduced capacity for abstraction, which means ability to think out of the box. I intentionally quoted dated information. All that stuff from Colson and from Postman, it's 30 years old. Do you think we're better? Do you think we, we're more refined in our social media and what's passing through the broadband today? Like television is old school, right? Day after day, week after week, even after evening, commercials and hours and hours of TV watching. We don't do that anymore. We do much worse. It starts with a discipline of refusal. So in answering the question, how can I be this, obedient to this command, I suggest to you, stop putting in some of the stuff that's going in. As Ken Hughes says, it will always, to every Christian in all time, it will not produce a Christian mind. And I hope you care enough about that to consider it. Because don't lie to yourself. What you put in, it's going to come out in some way or another. Another question. I've asked how can we be obedient to this command, and I've answered that by saying it starts with a discipline of refusal. Sort of dovetailed with that is when can I find time to appreciate and meditate on these qualities? <laughs> we are so busy. We have so little margin. When will you and I find time? Well, you'll have to answer that for yourself. And I have an answer. I have several answers. But before I give that answer, I want to ask my next question. Because it might be the most important one. And that is, where can I find these virtues? <laughs> where are they? 
Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. God. God is pure. God is true. God is lovely. He is just and he is noble. He is praiseworthy. He is full of virtue. And anything that is of God is always true about him. God's word. I, I'll just say it again. I mean, you are not going to... No, let me say it positively. You will always find these qualities in God and in God's word, in God's son, and in God's Holy Spirit. You will always find these qualities. So your personal time of open Bible, remember, it's outside of you. Your eyes are now looking at these words and you're bringing them in. As the psalmist said, I will think about what I have read. So maybe that dovetails to my second question. When can I find time to appreciate and meditate on these qualities? Redeem the time. I've started with where, which is, first of all, it's, it's anything that is divine, which, by the way, includes creation. Get outdoors. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I, I've, I have this wonderful habit that I've built into my life, which is get up early, make some coffee, put on a coat, and go stand at the end of the driveway. And there's a, very, there's a sweet spot right there because there's this sign on the road that blocks out the nightlight. And so it gives me this place where I don't have any artificial light coming into me, and I can just, and this morning, by the way, was spectacular early in the morning. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and the moon was just so brilliant. And I'm out there just thinking and praying and worshiping, and I saw a shooting star. star. And it was like this, in a split second, this, from my perspective, it was only about five inches long, right? Who knows how many millions of miles it spanned? But it just like was a flare. It was like a boom. I was, that was cool. We didn't got a cup of coffee. True story. This morning, we didn't got another cup of coffee. Came back out, stood there, saw another one. Identically the same appearance in a different part of the sky. Enjoying my coffee, worshiping God. Saw a third one. Identical to the other two saw a fourth one. I'm like, Lord, are you coming back? The sky's falling apart here. It was phenomenal. It was just a little time outdoors in God's creation. It was lovely. It was pure. It was just so good to bring that into our life. Where can I find these? In anything that is God, anything that is created, that, that is of God's creation. Look up into the heavens. But Paul uses the word whatever, which actually expands our perspective. And again, these are qualities that come out of a pagan society, lovely things and so on. And so I commend to you other things, good literature, good music. I mean, man was made to invent stuff. Because we're, we're created in God's image. So it's just, isn't it awesome to get to find a, the advances in, in thought that comes out of people's thought about things? How many times you've picked up a new tool and you go, man, I wish they had this like years ago. Somebody saw a need, invented something, tried it at work, markets it, boom, I'll pay whatever for it. And, and so you, you'll find something of quality in in inventions and architecture. I mean, come on, guys, we live in a campus. I mean, there's some amazing architecture on Cornell's campus. Art and music, good conversation. Joni and I watched Hamilton on Christmas or New Year's Eve, right? Couldn't understand 60% of what they were singing, <laughs> and it just kept coming at you. But thankfully, we had pre-read a little bit about the man's life so that we get a sense of what was going on. But you know, when it was all said and done, I said, that was genius. For that guy to read a book and then to put lyrics, modern lyrics, and, and musical genre, 
to that thing and to communicate that message, that was genius. I just applaud it. It's like, oh my gosh, look at that man has done good art, good literature. My friend that I have making as he walks every morning, he's a Pakistani man, professor at Ithaca College. Gotten to know him a little bit just because of the virus, right? I'm standing at the end of my driveway and he takes a walk early in the morning. So lately he's been coming by and he pulls out his phone and he puts it on pause. I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm listening to a book. Oh, which one? Uh, who is it? Uh, Tolstoy. Anna Karenina. He goes, my wife bought it for me. I'm listening. He says, it's amazing. It was like weeks ago. He comes by this morning. We had a nice conversation. We're in the book. He goes, oh, I'm right in the middle of it. I just can't put it down. Great literature, good art. There's quality in those things. So where can we find these virtues? <laughs> Let it be your, your mindset that you're going out and you're, you see something, give some thought to it. Make some margin in your life. So to answer the question, how can I do this, or, or when can I do this? Look, you can, just in your sort of mundane chores, <laughs> cleaning, or you're cooking, or maybe you're exercising, maybe you're exercising, right? Or you're just something that is mowing a lawn, <laughs> right? You can be training your mind to think prolonged over some of these qualities of things that you've read in the scriptures or things that you've seen in life or just in human experience. And then finally, what can we expect from this spiritual discipline? The God of peace will be with us. More order, less confusion. That's what it'll mean. Doesn't that sound good? More order, less confusion. Supernatural manifestation of God. I know I'm going a little long here, but that word logizomai is actually used again in Hebrews 11 of Abraham when God told him to go and kill his son, sacrifice your son, your only son. You know what it said? It said Abraham accounted. That means he gave extended thought to what God had commanded him to do. And he, his conclusion was this. You gave him to me supernaturally, and now you're asking me to take his life all I can conclude is that you will raise him from the dead because you are a supernatural working God. The God of peace was with Abraham as a result of his consideration of what God had asked him to do. God will be manifested supernaturally to you and I as a result of this. Praise the Lord. That is such a great encouragement to all of us. The God of peace and order will manifest himself in a greater way to you and I. That will be the benefit. That's what we can expect from this spiritual discipline. And also a good witness and good works. And finally, it will unite the church in purpose and praise. As I trust that it did to those young ladies within the church at Philippi. It really is life-changing to stop and to take your thoughts captive and to bring them to the obedience of Jesus Christ. In that process, then we get the mind of Christ. I got a feeling that what Paul is writing here, again, what he personally had experienced in his life, a hard life that he lived, there was a great output that came from what he considered, from what he observed outside of him in God's word, in God's creation, just in human existence. I got a feeling it may, may very well have been the very mind of Christ himself who saw things for what they really were. He saw the heart of man for what it really was. And yet he was never bummed out. He was always full of joy. And he was always at peace because his fixed his minds on things above, not on things of the earth. And he could see, even in that Roman paganistic world, he could see a sense of beauty 
in, in, in what man had produced. And you could appreciate, I know where that came from. You don't know where that came from, but that desire and that interest that you've produced, I know it came from my father. I gave it to you. And those are the things that kept him. And it produced a great witness, didn't it? God was manifested. So I hope I haven't given undue amount of weight to this idea of, of the spiritual discipline of the mind. And this has nothing to do with positive thinking. Okay, this is not a positive thinking message. Because if I understand that bad doctrine, that's trusting in what comes out of you or what is in you and you think positively to produce for yourself a good outcome. <clears throat> this is considering what's outside of you, and primarily anything that is from God, and thinking long and hard about those things. Train your mind, brothers and sisters. Starts with an act of refusal. If you will just put away some and take in more and give more effort to those things, God will be manifest. So it's a great way to start the new year <laughs> is to observe and consider our Savior and his life and his death for us. So God bless you. Let me pray. Becky, come on up. And Father, I thank you for the word of God. And I pray, Lord, that what well, I know, God, that this is your word. Paul's final words to his brothers, to his sisters, to the church. I pray that we will take heed, that we maybe even start by just considering these very words, considering, dwelling upon these very words themselves, and seeing what truths will be revealed to us to encourage us in our faith. And I thank you, Lord, that the Bible addresses things like the mind and the thought life, because you're concerned about the whole person. Just thank you, God, that you have created us and you've given us your word to reveal to us the potential that we can have in you and the joy that we can live with in this life, a healthy Christian life. Thank you for worship. Thank you for your son. As we dwell on him now, in Jesus' name, amen.